Welcome to this webinar on future directions of sustainability in chemical manufacturing. My name is Jessica Wolfman, and I am a research associate with the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The Roundtable provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues important to the chemical sciences and engineering and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This year, we are continuing our series of webinars on emerging topics. We launched our series of webinars last year, and all of the presentations and recordings from 2020 and 2021 are available on the CSR website. Today, we will, be, we will discuss incorporating sustainable practices into the many areas of chemical manufacturing as sustainability becomes more valuable to consumers and resources become more limited. The format will consist of three presentations. There will be time for one or two clarifying questions after each presentation, but all other questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the presentations. Dr. Timothy Patton will be our moderator for this webinar. He is a member of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable and the Deputy Division Director for the Chemical Bioengineering, Environmental and Transport Systems Division of the National Science Foundation Directorate for Engineering. He will be asking the questions on behalf of the audience. If we can advance the slide, please. Thank you, one more. Thank you very much. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom located in the bottom control panel. The chat feature has been disabled on Zoom for audience members. For those tuning in via live stream on the CSR website, please submit questions by email to csr at nas.edu or through the chat box on the live stream screen. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ed Ryder. Dr. Ryder is the director of the industrial program at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, where he develops and leads the strategic vision for the industrial sector, shapes the research and policy agenda, and convenes stakeholders to accelerate energy efficiency. Dr. Ryder. Uh, thanks, Jessica. And I'd like to thank the uh, National Academies for this opportunity to discuss decarbonization uh, with you. This is uh, a topic uh, that um, has got a lot of buzz uh, in the industry at this point, and I hope to provide an introduction to this topic. Next slide, please. So I'll cover four areas. Um, give you a quick snapshot of the energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S for the industrial sector, talk about decarbonization strategies and pillars. Uh, I'll highlight several roadmaps that provide guidance for this transformation on the path to zero net carbon. And I'll also talk about uh, pursuing opportunities, actions that are being taken in this space, uh, the commercial sector, as well as um, in some of the areas that are uh, earlier. Next slide. <clears throat> So if we look at the, at the current emissions across the industry, you can see that uh, the industrial sector accounts for about 28% of emissions in the US. A further breakdown uh, shows that the industrial sectors of refining, chemicals, iron and steel, food and cement account for the largest portion of the CO2 emissions from the industrial sector. Next slide. Oh, if you can go back one. Yes, thank you. Uh, you can also see where that energy is used. Uh, in particular, the energy, a large portion of it is used for process heating. Um, machine drives, probably second place, followed by cooling, other processes, et cetera. So process heat is a key opportunity for reducing CO2 emissions and energy use. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But first, next slide. Uh, let's talk about several different strategies. The first one, next click, uh, is to look at ways to decarbonize the inputs, power, feedstocks, materials. Uh, some of this can be switching to lower carbon sources. Some of it can be uh, avoiding um, some of the usage of materials where not necessarily needed. Next click, uh, you can see within the chemical fence line itself, <clears throat> uh, there's opportunities here to reduce process heat, make every unit of energy count, 
introduce new processes that are low carbon. And I'll talk about those um, briefly. And the next click, uh, you can see it's also important to think about decarbonizing supply chains. For a number of companies have seen that the largest portion of their CO2 footprint, particularly scope three, uh, so-called emissions is along the supply chains. The next click, uh, you'll see that it's important. In fact, it's vital uh, to increase the demand for low carbon products. Uh, those are called embodied carbon. If the demand is increased for this, that kind of market pull uh, allows industrial companies to help justify the investments that are being made and to help uh, improve the efficiency throughout the supply chain for delivery of those lower carbon products. Next slide. So let me talk about four main strategies, some of which can be used within the chemical fence line itself and in some cases outside the fence line. The first is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is the first primary fuel, uh, if you will, that needs to be considered in this case because not only does it have energy benefits, but there are also a multitude of non-energy benefits, which I'll mention shortly. Uh, it's also a pathway that industry is very familiar with, uh, especially heavy industry, uh, which means it has to be cost effective on energy. Um, the second I'll note is energy substitution, changing out hydrocarbon sources, for example, uh, from electrification, electricity, where the electricity comes from an increasingly green grid, uh, third, I'll note low carbon fuels and feedstocks. Uh, wind and solar can be used, for example, to generate hydrogen. And that hydrogen can be used not only for process heat, but it can also be used as a precursor in many, many chemical processes. Uh, and finally, after aggressively pursuing those first three pillars, there may be some CO2 uh, left over, and that's where mitigation option comes in, such as carbon capture, utilization and storage, direct air capture, uh, and others. Next slide. There have been a number of roadmaps uh, in this area that uh, look at ways to reduce the energy in the greenhouse gas footprint of chemical enterprises. I'll highlight three here, but uh, note that there's many others that are out there. Uh, back in 2013, a roadmap from the International Council of Chemical Associations, International Energy Agency, and DECMA looked at routes to improve chemical processes and reduce energy and greenhouse gases. The key findings included that uh, those chemical processes, mainly catalytic, could reduce CO2 emissions by over a billion tons a year and reduce over 12.3 quads, quadrillion BTUs of energy uh, by um, reducing the emissions from those chemical processes. Next, I'll highlight a roadmap from um, uh, National Labs plus E3, looked at decarbonization pathways across the US. And there's a series of roadmaps uh, in this uh, space that this group had done that are very well, very well done. Uh, finally, I'll note a roadmap recently uh, produced from the National Academies. Uh, it came out in 2021, that looks at the accelerating the transition for the US energy uh, sector but it also talks about how that transition in energy can benefit sectors such as uh, the industrial space. And it also includes diversity, equity, and inclusion aspects and other uh, social parts of the transformation that's needed. Next slide. Uh, a roadmap that's in flight at this point, I should say in review is one from the Department of Energy looking at RD and D uh, opportunities that are needed for this uh, transformation. A couple of key slides I'll highlight. This one shows that the path to a net zero uh, in 2050 uh, with these four different pillars can show that you could see in 2030, energy efficiency, the light green here, can have a market impact because they can be the first out of the gate. Uh, it has relatively low capital costs, um, and yet a number of energy and non-energy benefits. Uh, second, you can see kind of the uh, uh, the light tan uh, color, which is electrification, low carbon fuels, uh, can have an early start, but certainly uh, its impact can grow as additional infrastructure, such as the greening of the grid, uh, can help to have additional impact. In this case, electrification and low carbon fuels are combined because of the fact that they are closely connected. Uh, finally, I'll note that carbon capture utilization 
and storage and other mitigation options can have a substantial impact by 2050. I'll also note that you can see by 2050, there's still some of the blue bar left, uh, that even if you aggressively pursue those early options and carbon capture and utilization and storage, uh, it's likely that there's gonna be some CO2 emissions left. The reason why is that number of sources in the chemical industry are dilute, dispersed, and um, there's thousands of them in chemical facilities. It's really gonna be super difficult and expensive to capture all those. Hence, um, netting options, such as the use with uh, uh, forestry, uh, for example, or direct air capture or others, uh, may need to come in at the end to help mitigate the uh, CO2 emissions that are remaining. Next slide. Uh, I talked about process heat earlier. Let me note that that is one of the prime opportunities uh, in this space. Uh, some 60% of the greenhouse gases are associated with heating, another 3% are with cooling in the chemical enterprise. And if you look at the breakdown by temperature, degrees C here, uh, you can see that for the chemical industry, the light blue and the darker blue, temperatures below 150 degrees C uh, dominate. That temperature range is amenable to electrification and other relatively um, straightforward options at this point. A number of electric technologies are available, such as uh, industrial heat pumps, electric boilers, uh, infrared, microwaves, uh, the list, list goes on. And that's an area where adoption needs to be accelerated in the chemical enterprise, as well as demonstration uh, of some of the emerging technologies in that space. Next slide. Uh, a key slide from the DOE roadmap uh, that's uh, in flight at this point uh, is this one, looking at the landscape of decarbonization options. Uh, there's a lot on this slide. Let me break it down for you. The four pillars are on the outside, energy efficiency, electrification, low carbon fuels, and CCUS. And you can see that in the bands uh, that a number of investments are noted here. This isn't exhaustive, but it, these are illustrative examples of where investments are needed uh, in the next five years, the next 10 years, uh, all the way across to the next 30 years. And the key points are that a number of investments are needed in parallel uh, for the chemical industry to effectively reduce its energy and greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Secondly, I'll note that the um, kind of horizontal lines from upper left to lower right uh, that are marking the uh, time points, the five and 10 year time points, uh, suggest that there are also cross-cutting opportunities uh, in this space. The process heat is one, separations uh, is another uh, across this, this space. So it's important that we consider not only the opportunities within the bands that where investments are needed, but also the cross-cutting opportunities. Next slide, please. So there are barriers, of course, in this space. There are innumerable barriers, uh, in fact. I've listed just uh, five of them uh, in this case, but they're big ones. There are also opportunities. Uh, next click. Uh, there are commercial opportunities. There's opportunities for innovative processes uh, at this point, process improvements in the chemical space. Uh, and this is uh, an area where uh, not only at universities and industries, but national labs uh, need to work together to aggressively pursue uh, these opportunities. Next slide. I noted earlier, in addition to energy benefits, there's non-energy benefits, a selection of which are shown on this slide. Um, some of these I'll just point out is that uh, if you improve efficiency, you also can improve yield. Uh, you also can decrease maintenance cost. Um, in several cases, you can improve work for, workforce safety uh, and whatnot. And oftentimes these non-energy benefits are key to justification of implementing these uh, lower carbon processes and technologies. They're gonna be more expensive out of the gate. And so these justifications for the non-energy benefits are super important. Next slide. So this is also a prime opportunity for green chemistry and engineering to have a significant impact. Uh, this area has been developed over the last several years. Let me just highlight a couple of um, things that are going on in the commercial space. Ethylene, one of the biggest uh, uh, 
commodity products in this space. Um, there's moves for uh, benign by design improvements here. An electronic uh, cracker, for example, is being discussed and moved by several different companies. Uh, folks are looking at electrochemical reduction of CO2. And of course, uh, companies have worked on things such as sugarcane uh, routes to the ethylene for, for years, and that's a commercial process. Uh, as far as renewable feedstocks, groups such as uh, CF Industries and Yara are working on uh, demonstration projects for green hydrogen. Hydrogen accounts for some 50% of the energy spend in ammonia production. So if one can come up with uh, solar or wind routes to produce the electricity for that hydrogen, that's a definite route to reduce the, uh, the feedstock um, footprint, uh, CO2 burden. Uh, waste, um, companies such as uh, Lanza Tech are looking at ways of producing jet fuel uh, from carbon monoxide. Uh, that waste gas uh, through fermentation, they can produce ethanol uh, and then produce a jet fuel. And companies such as Shell and Suncor and Mitsui uh, are backing that project. Catalyst efficiency, uh, North Carolina State uh, has come up with a process to uh, greener route to styrene. Instead of 50% uh, uh, yield, can get upwards of 90% yield. It's also lower temperature. It's got 82% less energy spent. It can have 79% less, less CO2. Finally, uh, let me talk about uh, some examples for atom economy and circular uh, economy. Uh, groups are pursuing CO2 and some materials. For example, uh, Solidia and Carbon Free are working in the cement space. Uh, routes to reduce the uh, CO2 uh, that evolves from cement, particularly important because some 60% of the CO2 emissions uh, from cement are associated with chemistry. Uh, there's also work in this space relative to membranes and enzymes and, and others. So tremendous opportunity uh, here for green chemistry and engineering. And we'll hear some more of that from Jeff uh, shortly. Next slide. Uh, so let me wrap up here, uh, noting that uh, roadmaps uh, describe the opportunity in high level pathways uh, to pursue, but there's a lot of opportunity uh, in this space to figure out how to get past barriers. Uh, this is a white space for innovation, uh, prime opportunity where the chemical industry uh, has shown its uh, skills uh, in the past. Uh, but next click, uh, you'll see that, um, uh, yeah, go ahead to the next one that although we can see what's right in front of us and the barriers and the challenges, our crystal ball is a lot fuzzier uh, the further out we look. And so we need an agile, flexible approach uh, across the next 30 years. And I'll note that it's certainly time to pursue uh, transformative change uh, in this space. Next click. Uh, there's some references uh, here that I'll mention, you can see, and next click. At this point, I'll look forward to any conversation, any questions that come up, and look forward to the uh, talks from the other presenters. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, so we have some time for a few clarifying questions. Um, remind you again that you can type your questions into the, the chat below in Zoom, or you can uh, email. Um, the NAS email address. Okay, so we have a question from Laura Gagliardi. Do you think it's more of an engineering science problem or a policy problem? Uh, both. Uh, I would say uh, the policy is a challenge. There's a number of ad challenges here. Uh, if we had a carbon tax in the US, uh, that would help to spur things. But uh, as you can see from Europe, uh, Japan and elsewhere, Canada, that even with the policy uh, in place and a supportive policy, uh, there's a lot of transformative technology innovation uh, that's needed as well uh, in this space. So I would say both. Okay, and Ed, you mentioned uh, in one of your earlier slides that um, that one of the pieces to moving towards a more sustainable chemical industry is to increase the market pull for carbon, low carbon products. Could you talk a little bit more about what's going on in that space? Um, yeah, that's a good question, Tim. Uh, there are several um, initiatives in that space. Let me talk about uh, policy first. 
So in states such as California, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and others, uh, there's a session about a process called buy claim. The idea is that if the largest purchaser of goods in the US preferentially specified low carbon products, they would increase market pull. Of course, the largest purchaser is the government, right? So uh, that has been approved uh, in California. It's under discussion in those other states. Key to that process is having uh, what I'll call the knowledge infrastructure that will allow people to understand what is lower carbon. Environmental product declarations or EPDs uh, are part of that. Uh, and the, the first products uh, described there are construction products uh, such as uh, cement, uh, for example, and steel. Uh, and even for those relatively simple uh, products. Uh, we've seen a number of challenges in understanding the EPDs. So there's dozens of products in that space, but in the chemical sector, uh, there's over 70,000 products, chemical products made in the US. So having an EPD for every one of those products would be super difficult. So I, I think what's needed at this point is the development of that type of knowledge infrastructure so that we know what's, what's clean, uh, LCA is going to be uh, really important in that space and to have shared databases uh, that people have really high level of confidence in that so far. And the primary database uh, in that regard is a global database, which is not specific enough in some cases to be used for, for U.S. products. Great. And we have a, another question from Jivan Nakum. Uh, the question is, is it possible to make carbon neutral plastics or indefinitely recyclable polymers? Yeah, that's gonna be a good question for Jeff. But my answer to that is uh, yes, but uh, the proof is in the technology demonstrations, which are still, I think, in, in early stage. But one of the things you've seen in the chemical space that's a dramatic transition uh, is the look at chemical uh, recycling. 10, 15 years ago when I was involved in the space, uh, it was all mechanical recycling. And now there's a lot of um, resurgence uh, in looking at chemical recycling and doing that in ways that are uh, lowest impact. So yeah, good, good question. I, I think there's lots of opportunity in that space and Jeff will probably have some more comments. All right, and a question from Bob Maleska. Aside from CO2 capture and reuse, what are other needs to create a circular economy around energy? Um, I think part of that, uh, good question, Bob, part of it is looking at uh, taking waste uh, from stacks. So uh, Lonza Tech and other companies have been uh, working on that uh, part of things. Uh, I think improved ability to uh, recycle. One of the biggest challenges in the recycling space is the purity uh, of the supply and the costs associated with cleaning up the supply, uh, such, as, such as plastics. Uh, but you see that in areas such as in steel. Um, a number of the processes such as EAF processes in steel are principally based on having the ability to recycle those materials. So I think the opportunity uh, is really there in that space. And for the chemical industry, uh, it's, a, it's a big opportunity area that I think it is just starting to be tapped. Okay, there, there are a bunch more questions uh, and I think we're gonna have to reserve those for the discussion after our third seminar speaker and we'll move on to our next speaker. So thank you, Ed, for your presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Coates. Dr. Coates is the Tisch Professor, University Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Cornell University. The broader impacts of his research include benign polymers and chemical synthesis, the utilization of renewable resources and materials, and safe and economical energy storage and conversion. Jeff, take it away. Great, can, can you hear me, Tim? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm, I'm on the road and yeah, I just got a thing that said my internet's unstable, so. Um... I don't know, let me know if I cut out. So um, thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, and you know, thanks for the leading questions. Um, I'm the polymer uh, person for, the, for this meeting. And today I'll be telling you about some of the um, projects that, um, that my group and other groups around the world are looking at to improve the sustainability of plastics. Um, so 
you know, I, I probably don't have to, you know, impress upon you the importance of plastics. There's so many applications that these materials um, can do, you know, e you know, especially in the pandemic, um, safety materials, making our cars lightweight and more fuel efficient, um, basically protecting our food, um, transporting our water. Um, but these all come with a price. And if you, um, you know, just look at the use of plastics, I think everybody would agree it's, it's spectacular. Um, the problem is we make, um, make a lot of plastic, 300 million tons every year of plastic are made annually. Um, the way they're made, um, as Ed already mentioned, um, these are um, relatively carbon expensive processes. So from capturing either fuel or natural gas, um, doing refinery transformations of it, polymerizing it um, to make your average polymer, your, your, the carbon footprint is about three pounds of CO2 per pound of plastic. Okay, so we clearly need to improve on that. If um, we take um, transportation and energy and decarbonize it, the chemical industry is gonna be one of the, um, the big sources of CO2 that we're gonna have to, uh, to work on. Okay, so I've already mentioned, you know, I think we all agree plastics are great when we're using them, but then there's this other end where when we're done with them, um, worldwide about 40% end up in landfills. That's um, not sustainable for the long haul. About a third end up in the ocean, in soil and in air. Um, obviously, we need to need, need to fix that. Uh, some of these are incinerated. You at least get some energy from them, um, but then it uh, makes CO two. Um, that only about fourteen percent are collected for recycling. And I'll um, talk a little bit more about that. Not all of these materials that are collected for recycling are actually recycled. Um, so we, you know, we want to keep the good stuff and get rid of how they're made, um, the carbon footprint of these materials and also um, worry about kind of the end of life of, of these polymers. Okay, um, you know, I, I give a general talk and I, I probably more scientists on, so this maybe isn't so relevant, but I think if I asked a lot of people, you would look at this and go, you know, I think that's a famous painting by, by Seurat. Um, but if you actually blow this up and look in, um, this is not the original painting. It's a, it's a, um, a, a, a kind of an art representation of, of this painting made with bottle caps. and. This particular painting is representative of about 400,000 bottle caps. Um, that's about the number of plastic bottles we use every minute in the United States. So, um, you know, we clearly are making a lot of these plastics and, um, and our mission is to try to figure out how to make them better and, and get rid of them at the end of use. So um, today I'm going to talk about some of the, the ways that um, my group is attacking this problem. Um, I thought I would start out with um, um, kind of an overview of, of what we're trying to do. So if you could go back in time and try to change the way um, we make and use plastics, there would be a lot of interest and there already is a lot of interest in using renewable feedstocks to make these plastics, not fossil fuels. Um, we'd like to try to time the lifetime of the polymer that we're using um, with its um, application. So, you know, if we're going to use a plastic spoon for 15 minutes, do we really want to make it out of a material that if it gets in to the ocean, it would float around for a hundred years? Um, you know, probably not. So try to match the lifetime of the material in the environment with its use time. Um, we'd like to um, limit the energy and raw material consumption. I've already talked about that. Ed talked about that. Um, now, if you're going to change the polymers that we make, um, we can't make polymers that have poor properties. Consumers are used to these great materials. And I've got a bottle here on my desk in my room. It's a, you know, if I drop this from six feet up, it's not going to break. Um, we've got to make materials that are as good as what's out there. We also have to consider cost. Um, it's not a scientific, um, you know, constraint, but it is an economic one. We can't make materials that are a lot more expensive than what's out there. You could argue that if you want people to adopt these materials, they actually have to be cheaper um, to, to get the interest of, of the end users to, to use these new materials. So I've drawn this very optimistically, like there is some magic intersection of these five areas. Um, we're pretty far away from achieving that. Um, so I'm going to go through and tell you um, some of the things that are being done to try to address the sustainability of plastics. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, can we flip the script instead of making, um, taking fossil fuel as our, as our building block, making um, a good amount of carbon dioxide, um, and making materials that if they get into the environment, they'll be there for a long period. Um, you know, can we flip the script? Can we actually use carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, which you can get through the reduction of carbon dioxide? Um, can we use biomass, readily available biomass? Ideally, 
you know, non-food source biomass. Um, can we make these polymers? Um, and then can we, at the end of life, can we have materials that are um, so, um, ocean and soil degradable? Um, even better than that, you know, why feed, um, why feed bacteria? Wouldn't it be better if we can have a chemical recycling where we, um, you know, we have an object when it's used up, we can then do um, energy efficient chemical processes to break it back down to the monomer. The monomer could then ideally be purified and brand new pristine polymer. So this would make polymers maybe a little more like the aluminum can, right? The aluminum atoms can be used infinitely. Um, plastics, we can't just infinitely recycle the, the base plastic because um, you know issues with purification, issues with changing molecular weights and, and compositions. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some concrete things that um, at least that my lab has been doing. Um, the first thing is we've um, done a lot of work to look at carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide as building blocks um, for making polymers. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to um, the NSF for longtime support of our work on carbon dioxide um, and the Department of Energy for its longtime support of our work on using carbon monoxide. Um, you know, to this group, I probably don't have to, you know, impress why we'd want to use these materials. Um, but one of the things I would like to mention is that, you know, we got into this from a, a basic science standpoint. These are hard molecules to um, do reactions with. And we thought, you know, even if we could make things that um, on any scale, it, it would be a, a kind of a scientific challenge. So um, we've done a lot of work um, for the chemists. These are some of the molecules that we've been working on. Um, these are very unreactive carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide molecules. And so we have to use molecules that bring energy to the table, um, molecules such as the epoxide. And we've um, worked on making these um, polycarbonates and, and polyesters. Um, I'm gonna show you some of the, um, you know, the real world scale up of these materials really briefly, um, just to show that, um, you know, these started out as academic curiosities, um, but they're being translated um, ideally into materials that'll be, you know, on the marketplace in the near future. Um, so the first molecule that we um, made was this um, polycarbonate. Um, for those of you who are chemists, this is the catalyst, kind of the magic um, you know, foo-foo dust that makes this thing work. Um, we started out as uh, making these polymers because these have been known to use for high barrier uh, films, for loss foam casting, to make, you know, metal engines and things like that, very energy efficient, electronics. Um, these are relatively small scale applications. So um, bigger scale is, you know, can liner materials for um, beverage cans, polyurethane insulation um, and things. And to do that, we needed um, a low molecular weight polycarbonate. And so we spent a lot of time developing a catalyst that would do that. Um, I'm going to cut to, you know, kind of where we, um, where we left this project and um, a company called Novomer, of which I'm a, a, a co-founder, um, started to scale these up. Um, Ford a few years ago announced that they're going to try to move over to the foams in their, in their automobiles to use this uh, CO2-based polymer. There's about 30 pounds of foam in a typical vehicle. And just, you know, shifting in that one small application um, will reduce fossil fuel use by about 600 million pounds per year. Um, Novomer sold that technology to Aramco. Um, Aramco Performance Materials is in the process of scaling it up. So hopefully that'll soon come to, um, to the marketplace. Um, another polymer that um, came out of my lab um, also transitioned over to, to Novomer. Um, more recently, uh, Danimer Scientific has, has purchased this technology is to take ethylene, and ethylene can made, be made from shale gas, um, could be made from ethanol that you could get, for example, from sugar cane or corn. Um, ethylene can be oxidized with oxygen to make ethylene oxide. This is currently the way they, they make this on a, on a huge industrial scale. Um, we then take with our catalyst, we combine it with carbon monoxide, and we make this molecule called propriolactone. Um, propriolactone can be polymerized um, to give a, it's a new the world polymer, but it has some pretty interesting uh, properties has really good mechanical properties, which of course is kind of the first thing you'd want. It's got a low carbon footprint. It's got really good gas barrier properties for food application. Um, it's compostable. It's ocean degradable. Um, it's also chemically recyclable. You can pyrolyze it to make um, to make acrylic acid. Okay, so um, continuous pilot plant. Um, this is the uh, this is the polymer. This was an announcement that. Novomer made back in March um, before it was um, transitioned to Danimer. Um, and they've announced that they're going to be um, making this a 80,000 um, ton commercial facility um, by next year, which is pretty aggressive, but um, 
they're they're working really hard to do that. Okay, um, a brief um, interlude on plastic materials that are used for um, recycling. Um, very small amount of the plastics that we use in plastic packaging is actually recycled. Um, the real number is about 2%, 14 is collected. Their process losses, um, some downgrading of the application of the material um, to you know plastic two by fours, things like that, that are not the original application of the material. So really only about 2% of packaging materials um, undergo what we call closed loop recycling. And we'd like to make that better. Um, one of the problems with recycling is not all plastics are the same and you can't just take um, all plastics and melt them down and make something new out of it. Um, a lot of plastic packaging is high density polyethylene or, or polypropylene. Some things like a pill bottle, they're made out of polyethylene and polypropylene. The Tide bottle is a good example of that as well. And so um, if you try to recycle um, a, a high you know, purity polyethylene stream, it's always gonna have some polypropylene in it unless you really carefully um, separate the materials and that's, that's too cost prohibitive. Um, so here is a, a movie. If you took um, a 70-30 mixture of polyethylene and polypropylene, it looks like a nice plastic, but if you um, simply give it a, um, you know, a tug, it rips more like a piece of paper than a nice piece of plastic. Um, scientifically, we know why that is. These polymers are different. They macrophase separate, um, making the polymer really, really brittle. Um, so my lab um, decided that we might be able to make some compatibilizers by making black copolymers of polyethylene and polypropylene. Um, again, a big shout out to the National Science Foundation, who has been a longtime funder of our work um, on making um, sustainable plastics. This is through the Center of Sustainable Polymers um, at the University of Minnesota. And we had a project, um, again, this was basic science. Can we, can we make these polymers? Can we make black copolymers of basically the world's number one and number two polymers. Um, people hadn't done that before, um, at least to make multi-block copolymers and to be able to efficiently tailor the architecture. Um, we thought from this basic science, then we can make materials and then try to look at how architecture um, can impact performance. Um, so this is um, a paper we published um, um, in 2017. I've already showed you what happens if you don't efficiently separate um, waste polyolefins into really clean polyethylene or polypropylene streams. Um, now I'm gonna show what happens if you add in just 1% of our tetrablock copolymer. So this is a material here, um, looks kind of like that other material that was really brittle. If you try to rip that material, it's really, really tough. It's, it seems like it's a totally different material. The only difference is we've added this tetrablock copolymer. It compatibilizes the two different polymers so it brings them together at the interface and provides a molecular stitch to basically tie it together. Um, so here are some mechanical properties of these materials, um, stress strain properties of the alloys of, of 7030 with our multi-block additive um, really are kind of, you know, it's kind of like the stainless steel of the polymer world. We've made now an alloy um, that we think is going to have properties that are at least as good, if not maybe even better um, than polyethylene or polypropylene. Um, this technology is being commercialized by um, a startup called Intermix um, Performance Materials. Okay, I think I've only got a couple minutes left, so I wanted to um, end up with a paper that we just published. Um, and this idea goes back to what I mentioned at the beginning, I think are, you know, a real dream. And this, um, you know, thanks to, I think, um, Jivon that asked a question about chemical recycling. You know, can you make a polymer that has good properties um, and use it for whatever application and then collect it at the end of use? And of course, um, you know, there could be some applications where you just melt it down and make a new object out of it. But, you know, if, if, if I'm going to eat my yogurt out of a container that might have been somebody's, I don't know, motor oil bottle or got, you know, who knows what, um, you know, I'm going to worry about that. I really like to know that it's brand new polymer. And so this idea of chemical recycling back to the monomer and where you take that monomer, then repolymerize it completes um, you know, this, this cycle. And so, um, you know, they're doing that with a polyolefin industry. I think, you know, the, the question will remain, um, can you do that in an economically um, energy efficient process? A lot of heat and a lot of energy goes into breaking down these polymers um, like polyethylene and polypropylene. Um, so we designed um, a, a new polymer and this is a polymer. It's actually been known, DuPont um, published patents on this back in the, the 19. Um, 1940s. It's a polyacetal. Um, they couldn't make high molecular weight. And, and basically before we made high molecular weight of this polyacetal, um, properties were really brittle. 
but we got a new um, new catalyst. Um, this is work supported by the Department of Energy um, to polymerize this um, DXL monomer, which can be made from um, basically from wood, from methanol, uh, from aldehyde, and, and ethylene glycol, which could become from sugar. Um, and we have a catalyst system that allows us to make really high molecular weight polymer. Um, what's great is with a, a strong acid catalyst, which can be a solid acid, which you recover, um, Dow X resin, for example, um, we can heat that up to just, you know, a little bit over 100, 150 degrees, and it efficiently depolymerizes. It also cleanly um, polymerize, depolymerizes in the presence of other polymers. So you might, in the recycle stream, have other plastics present. Um, so this is a, um, a movie. We've got all these different plastics in here, and we have our polyacetal um, polymer. We're heating this to 150 degrees. You can maybe see the dial here. This is in minutes. We're speeding this up. But over here, we're really um, efficiently collecting. In this particular case, we got 96% um, depolymerization back to um, the dioxalane monomer. Um, in all you know, other cases, um, you can heat this polymer. It's totally thermally stable up to over 250 degrees Celsius, um, but only in the presence of a really strong acid catalyst will um, it depolymerize. So I think my time's up. Um, I want to you know, quickly analyze some of the students that have, that have done this work. This is our first um, kind of um, group picture in about two years. Um, especially like to, I think I've already mentioned the um, National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, um, who has been a longtime funder of the basic research we do in these areas, um, and also in some of the startups that are commercializing um, these polymers. So I'll stop there and um, answer your questions. All right, Jeff, thank you very much for that seminar. I would remind the attendees that they can ask questions in the chat at the bottom of the Zoom or by emailing the question to csr at nas.edu, and that will be entered into the chat as a question as well. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, one from Mark Jones. Uh, there are a number of commercial compatibilizers for polyethylene and polypropylene that have been and are on the market by several producers, including block of polymer offerings. How are these deficient and what is the remaining commercial need? Yeah, um, so we've talked to two dozen recyclers um, in the polyolefin area. Nobody can afford the, the current materials that are out there. Um, there are a number of polymers that are made, um, you know, one, one is a material made by Dow, one's made by Exxon. You need to put about um, anywhere between eight or 10 or even more percent of these materials in to get good compatibilization. You know, if the compatibilizer costs $2 a pound, you have to put, you know, 20 cents of a compatibilizer in to um, remediate a pound of a, of a mixed plastic. Recyclers can't afford that. Right now they can afford about five cents a pound. Um, and so you need a much more um, potent compatibilizer if you're going to make these economically viable. Um, that's not to say you can't compatibilize, make alloys that maybe have better properties and use them in high value application. But in the recycling industry, um, and I've asked, um, I've asked a number of the companies that make these for, um, you know, any application where they actually use it in, you know, post-consumer waste and in kind of low value applications. And um, I haven't been able to find one. So, um, so the real, the real problem is the, um, the, the potency of what's on the market. Uh, great. I, I see that we're coming close to 1145. There are a few more questions in the Q&A, and I think we're just going to have to save those for the discussion afterwards. All right. So thank you again, Jeff, for your seminar. Uh, and our third speaker is Dr. Peter Levi. Dr. Levi leads the sectoral analysis of industry within the Energy Technology Policy Division of the International Energy Agency. His work is focused on the technologies and policies that can be employed to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions from hard to abate sectors within industry, as well as cross-cutting themes such as energy security, hydrogen, carbon capture, and electrification. And Peter, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Tim and Jessica and uh, everyone at the uh, National Academies for um, inviting me to speak and present our work. Um, just to check it, you can hear me okay? I'm assuming because no one stopped me that you, that you can. Um, I'm going to provide a, an overview 
of uh, a publication that we released in, in May of this year um, called Net Zero by 2050. And this is a roadmap for the global energy sector, the first of its kind that the IEA uh, released. Um, and it, it paints a, a picture for, um, a, it, well, it outlines a possible pathway to net zero emissions from the whole energy system by 2050, as the, as the title suggests. This was the work of you know, 40 or 50 people, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to um, totally do it justice in, in 15 or 20 minutes, but I thought I'd start by providing a, a high-level overview of the, of the uh, overall analysis, so at the energy system level, um, and then move to focus on the industry sector transition. And when we talk about industry at the IEA, we're talking about uh, lots of the topics that we've heard already, so the chemical industry, um, but also I was asked to provide a bit of an insight into um, other areas of the industry sector, so non-metallic minerals, and uh, of which uh, the cement is, uh, is particularly important, among which the cement is particularly important, and the iron steel industry, among several other sectors. So I'll tailor the presentation towards uh, the industry sector uh, after an overview. So um, I'm just seeing if I can control the slides. That's working. That's great. Um, so by way of introduction to the overall um, energy system level analysis, um, this was conceived in the context of uh, many government and company announcements uh, to reach net zero emissions uh, by the year 2050. Some countries are aimed to achieve this target earlier, some, some later. Um, but uh, 2050 is increasingly the uh, target year around uh, which climate ambition is, is measured for um, national and company targets. Um, net zero pledges uh, of this type, so net zero by 2050 or some other year, um, today cover around 70% of global GDP and CO2 emissions. However, however uh, fewer than uh, a quarter of announced net zero pledges are fixed in domestic uh, legislation and fewer still are underpinned by specific measures um, or policies to deliver um, them in full and on time. One of the key components of our scenario analysis that we did for the uh, Net Zero by 2050 report, um, and in our scenario, which is called the Net Zero Emissions by 2050, or just NZE scenario, is a series of detailed uh, milestones, more than 400 actually in total in the, in the full analysis, which is available online. Um, which are designed to help governments see the scale uh, of the challenge that's ahead of us um, and provide some tangible examples of the scale of deployment um, required for specific technologies and sectors in the energy system. Um, I'll just provide a, a few examples here, um, and you'll see some appear on the slide. Um, annual capacity additions of solar PV and wind have quadrupled in the last decade they need to quadruple again over the next decade in the NZE. Um, they're more than 1,000 gigawatts uh, in 2030. This is PV and wind combined, and they provide uh, around 40% of electricity generation, um, again, by 2030, up from around 9% uh, today. Um, electric car sales must increase 18-fold, uh, up from around 5% of sales uh, today. When I say today, 2020 was the base year for this analysis. Um, to about 60% of total sales by 2030. Um, and by 2035, there are no new sales of internal uh, combustion uh, cars globally in this, in this scenario. Boosting energy efficiency, as was mentioned by uh, Ed, um, in the context of the chemical industry, is absolutely key, key in, the, uh, in the context of the broader energy system analysis here. Um, this is also important for increasing energy security um, even with the rapid growth in low emissions power generation and um, the most secure form of energy and energy security is a key uh, area that the IEA works on, a key aspect of our mandate. And um, energy that's not used is uh, really the kind of securest form of, uh, or the most secure form of uh, energy that you can get. Um, the, uh, on the efficiency front, around 20% of existing buildings globally need to be ret retrofitted uh, by with um, to be zero carbon ready uh, by 2030, compared to less than 1% of uh, buildings um, of the building stock today. And overall, the energy intensity of the global economy uh, must fall by around 4% per year in this scenario, about three times um, the average rate achieved over the last two decades. So this is just a snapshot of the analysis, but you can read about uh, the kind of full energy system results um, in, uh, on the online publication, which is available for free on our, on our website. 
Um, some of the milestones I've mentioned there for 2030 um, are things where there's already encouraging progress we can see today, um, and the technologies themselves can continue being uh, deployed at scale. The remaining challenge um, is uh, for these technologies that are kind of ready, uh, uh, is getting the policy framework right um, and achieving further incremental gains in performance and driving down costs and so on. Um, technologies that are available in the marketplace today um, provide nearly all of the emissions reductions to 2030 in the NZE. However, reaching uh, net zero emissions by 2050 will require much more than just deploying these technologies that we have available um, at our disposal today and that are market ready critically. Um, we will need uh, innovative technologies um, to tackle what we refer to as the hard to abate emissions within the uh, within the energy system and the hard to abate sectors, if you like, um, uh, which we um, categorize or designate as the, the long distance transport modes and the heavy industry sectors. Um, these technologies uh, that are uh, not uh, kind of market ready today um, comprise uh, particularly technologies that uh, involve the application of CCUS, um, also CCUS carbon capture utilization and storage technologies, um, hydrogen and some sustainable bioenergy and direct electrification uh, technologies. And there are a number of examples that are provided here of those technologies where, you know, innovation still needs to take place. Um, and we uh, use, utilize all of the technologies listed on this slide in our analysis. Um, and so, yeah, these innovation milestones are something that we lay out in quite a lot of detail for each of these sectors and technologies in the roadmap where really a, a lot of progress needs to take place um, for them to be deployed at scale. Um, so that was an overview of some of the key uh, milestones and considerations around uh, innovative uh, technologies in the broader energy system analysis. And now I'd like to uh, focus on, on the industry sector specifically. Um, so industry uh, sector emissions, cement, steel, uh, chemicals, and uh, several other um, uh, industry sectors besides those heavy industry sectors cannot be neglected uh, nor entirely offset um, by carbon removal technologies in other sectors. Um, and that's because they are, they are large, of course. And in, uh, industry emissions uh, amounted to around eight and a half gigatons in 2020, or around a quarter of total energy sector emissions. Advanced economies account for around a fifth of these today, uh, whereas the emerging market and developing economies account for the remaining 80% of all fifths. Um, three heavy industry sectors, which I've mentioned already, steel, chemicals, and cement, um, account for 70% of the emissions from the industry sector um, and are the key components of this hard to abate uh, designation uh, that I mentioned earlier. Heavy industry uh, sectors use large quantities of fossil fuels uh, for three key purposes. So the first among those is, uh, is to generate high temperature heat. And the second is for use as feedstock um, or raw material inputs, particularly relevant to the chemical sector. And then lastly, as uh, chemical reduction agents, particularly relevant to the iron and steel sector where coal or in the form of coke, well, once transformed to coke is used as a carbon-based reduction agent to produce uh, steel, well, iron initially, and then steel from uh, iron ore. And the problem is that fossil fuels provide these energy services in heavy industry sectors so well and cheaply uh, today, and directly substituting these with uh, electricity um, is either expensive or impractical with the technologies that we have um, in, in many instances today. Um, there's one other key uh, technical feature of the heavy industry sectors that contributes to this um, hard to abate uh, designation that we give them. Um, and that's, that's the, to do with the uh, existing assets that these uh, industries comprise today. These tend to be emissions intensive and long lived. Uh, sorry, emissions intensive and capital intensive and long-lived. Long um, I'm talking here about uh, assets in the um, heavy industry sector, so cement kilns, steam crackers, ammonia and methanol production facilities. Um, but as an illustrative, illustrative example here, I'm showing uh, the iron making equipment in the iron and steel sector. So this is uh, DRI and uh, blast furnaces. Here we can see the, the uh, age profile and, and ge geographical distribution of, uh, of these two types of furnaces in the iron and steel sector. 
um, and relative to a typical lifetime of around 30 to 40 years for these uh, pieces of equipment, we estimate that the average age is around 10 to 15 years old on average uh, for heavy industry assets across the board, so including uh, cement kilns and uh, uh, equipment for producing primary chemicals in the, uh, in the chemical sector. And as I mentioned, there's a, a huge uh, concentration of heavy industry capacity in the um, emerging market and developing economies, and particularly uh, in China, which accounts for around 60% of iron making capacity uh, shown here. It's a similar basic, uh, picture for cement um, with, uh, with respect to China. Um, much of the country's enormous uh, fleets of steel and cement plants have been installed in the last two decades. And as a result, around 85 to 90 percent of the steel, steel and cement sector um, assets are less than 20 years old in China. More than half the cement plants um, are less than 10 years old. Without any alteration to the mode of operation of these assets, um, existing just the existing stock of assets in heavy industry sectors could lead to around 150 gigatons of CO2 emissions um, if operated to the end of their typical lifetimes. And just to put that in context, in the context of the net zero emissions scenario for the whole energy system, we're talking about cumulative emissions and there's lots of complicated uh, subdivisions here of where which sectors get get uh, what quantity of emissions, but around about 500 gigatons of, of CO2 that we're working with as a, a sort of budget um, for that uh, scenario. Um, so as you can see, just the emissions from this assets and leaving aside any uh, capacity additions that will uh, no doubt be required to meet rising demand for these materials and exceed the envelope of the net zero emissions scenario for these specific sectors, the green line there, and uh, this all paints uh, quite a bleak picture in terms of the quantities of emissions that can be expected from existing industrial equipment absent any intervention. But it's not all bad news when with respect to existing assets. There are several interventions um, and improvements that can be made to existing assets, uh, to, uh, including uh, incremental energy efficiency improvements, uh, the blending in of low carbon fuels, um, and, several, and in several instances, uh, the application of uh, CCUS uh, in, a, in a retrofit um, arrangement. The other thing to highlight is that the, the dynamics of investment cycles, whereby every 20, 25 years or so, a plant operator will face a decision as to whether to uh, renew or upgrade or replace uh, a key piece of capital intensive um, equipment. Um, we can look at the, the um, investment or the cycle of time that uh, takes place there and project forward emissions from these assets on that basis. And that's the darker shaded uh, purple area here. If these investment cycles are strategically considered alongside the availability and development of innovative technologies, the importance of which I stressed uh, earlier in, in the presentation, um, we estimate that around 40% or around 60 gigatons of the emissions from existing heavy industry assets um, could be avoided as long as the innovative technologies are available um, in time to replace them at the end of this investment cycle. Of course, existing assets are only part of the story when it comes to achieving uh, deep emissions reductions in heavy industries. Um, a portfolio of mitigation options is uh, uh, leveraged to achieve a 95% reduction um, in emissions between 2020 and 2050 in the NZE, uh, in the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario. Um, and while certain segments of material demand are expected to expand rapidly um, over, the, over the coming years, um, steel and cement for renewable in energy infrastructure, for example. Um, the NZE also embodies a strong push on material efficiency strategies across supply chains. Um, these are strategies uh, including uh, uh, modular and lightweight design practices, uh, yield improvements, life extensions, increased, increased collection and recycling rates, um, among several other strategies. These together contribute around a fifth of the emissions reductions when we show when we decompose this on a uh, on a strategy basis on a mitigation measure basis. They comprise around a fifth of the emissions reductions um, that take place uh, to 2050 in the NZE. Incremental energy efficiency measures, together with various categories of fuel shifts to electrify and other otherwise integrate uh, renewable um, uh, heat into uh, production. 
uh, account for a further 30% of uh, emissions reductions in the NZE. Um, and then around 50% of emissions reductions are achieved through the application of CCUS and hydrogen technologies, many of which are not commercially available um, in heavy industry sectors today. Um, this is uh, this innovation dimension is reflected in the in the right hand side of the second part of this uh, decomposition analysis, uh, where we can see that around 60% of the emissions reductions in heavy industries um, in the NZE are derived from technologies that are um, either at demonstration or prototype phases uh, in their development today. So if you delve a little deeper into the specific categories of innovative technologies that play an important role in each of these heavy industry sectors, we can see in some important differences as well as some parallels between them. Um, so starting with primary chemical production, uh, we can see that electrolytic hydrogen production uh, for use as feedstock um, becomes a, a key means of decarbonizing large chunks of ammonia and uh, to a lesser extent methanol production. Direct electrification of steam cracking, um, something that also Ed mentioned, the uh, kind of initial pilots that are going on in that area, um, also plays a role in the chemical industry. Um, but the need to retain uh, carbon as an inher inherent part of the production process means that CCUS technologies um, are needed to capture process emissions and to alleviate the need, to, alleviate the need uh, to source large quantities of biogenic or atmospheric CO2 for, to replace this um, feedstock carbon. Um, in primary steel production, there's also a very important role for electrolytic hydrogen production, primarily through its use in the hydrogen-based uh, DRI uh, process, this is the direct reduction of iron, um, and also in the, as a blending strategy in existing uh, iron making assets, so both in blast furnaces and in DRI furnaces that we have on the system today. The innovative smelting reduction uh, pathway, this is a, a project, um, or this is a technology that's um, a, a demonstration phase today. Um, this uh, smelting reduction uh, method of producing uh, iron uh, results in a relatively pure uh, process stream of CO2, um, which better facilitates uh, carbon capture. And that's also a key uh, among the kind of CCUS equipped portion of the technologies that are deployed in the iron and steel sector. Um, in the cement se sector, the heavy lifting is really done by uh, CCUS technologies and carbon capture and, and utilization and storage technologies, whether post-combustion, pre-combustion, or uh, partially, uh, full or no, partial uh, oxy-fueling arrangements, pre-combustion arrangements. Um, hydrogen and direct electrification also play a modest role here, but these, uh, these uh, innovative technologies um, in those specific categories do nothing to address the process emissions that uh, um, result from producing clinker. Um, so carbon capture is still needed at vast scale. In all three sectors, uh, innovative technology, um, these broad innovative technology categories that are shown here in aggregate uh, account for an excess of 90% of uh, production on a mass basis from these sectors by 2050. So I'm going to keep it relatively short and stop there, but just acknowledge up front that I've focused on entirely on the on the technology story in our uh, NZE uh, scenario, and uh, given just given the limited time um, and the technology focus of uh, of the event today. Um, but I'd like to underscore the uh, the evident point that um, the other side of the industrial decarbonisation coin is is policy, um, and it's highly unlikely that the technology transition that's been outlined here. And will take place without a strong uh, push from policymakers to establish the right conditions for these technologies um, to emerge. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there and I look forward to taking your questions. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking that maybe we should move on to the discussion. I see a couple of questions for you, Peter, and maybe that we'll use that to start off the discussion since a couple of these look like ones that our other speakers could chime in on as well. So I uh, just want to remind everyone that if you have questions, you can submit them to the question and answer function at the bottom of your Zoom, or you could send an email to csr at nas.edu, and that will be transferred into the question and answer field as well. Um, so if I could ask uh, Jeff and Ed to come back on, and we'll... Um, start the discussion section of this webinar. Um, and I'll start off with a 
question specifically for Peter at first from Bella Subramanian. Does the IEA have any recommendations for how governmental agencies and private industries should partner to fund and deploy the innovations that are rather urgently needed to achieve substantial reductions in CO2 emissions? Thanks very much for the question. Um, indeed, this is an area where we, you know, we provide uh, a kind of menu of, of policy options and a certain degree of collaboration between uh, um, policymakers and, and governments um, between them and the private sector is certainly a kind of an ingredient of that um, uh, policy menu. I think that, you know, the, the role for governments in the areas that I've been talking about, um, you know, spans the whole uh, pipeline of development for these technologies, but particularly, you know, the upfront stages of technology development where you need to go from, um, you know, uh, essentially concept stage uh, design that's uh, developed in laboratories and in, in testing facilities through to a, a kind of full-scale prototype and then through to a demonstration scale plant. These initial first uh, plants in, in the industry sector for demonstrating these technologies actually work and uh, can be run at, uh, you know, in the conditions that um, the industry sector faces every day. Those are areas where government support is no, no doubt required for, um, uh, for, those, uh, for those plants to get off the ground. I think there's, there's a next uh, phase of establishing um, markets, differentiated markets for some of the products from these industries. Um, so the government, again, can have an important role there by uh, leveraging its, its large uh, procurement, um, a large role in procurement for various uh, government infrastructure and, and services. Um, to set up differentiated markets for products that are produced in a low emissions way. Those are just some examples, but I mean, government's role um, in the industry sector for these technologies is, is directly linked to, um, you know, the, the private sector uh, actors' roles. Um, and there are a number of examples that we outline of, of specific examples of, of how that can take place. Hey, Ed or Jeff, you want to add anything in? Um, I think it's a really good question. A, a couple of um, comments I'll, I'll make is that uh, the discussion of the industrial sector and how to reduce its emissions uh, is a topic that has been discussed on the on the Hill uh, in Congress amongst uh, senators and representatives. Uh, some provisions got included in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but they really just scratched the surface of what's needed. The reconciliation bill, although we have, uh, we at ACCAA and several others have proposed a number of uh, initiatives, uh, just doesn't look very good for them to be incorporated at this point. So I put in the uh, answer to the question, uh, a link to some of those provisions you can look at further. Um, but I think a challenge in this space is that the policymakers, you know, it's, they just want to look at a silver bullet and they say, well, you know, um, for industry, uh, here's a little bit of money for hydrogen or a little bit of money for CCUS and done, check the box, uh, let's move on. But the challenge uh, is that some estimates for the transformation in the industrial sector uh, suggest that what's needed is upwards of four to six trillion dollars. And what they're getting uh, right now is, uh, you know, uh, tens of billions uh, of dollars. So it, it's really, a misperception, I think, of what's really needed at this point. So something that's needed uh, is certainly partnership across industries, national laboratories, uh, agencies, uh, and others to understand how to take initiatives from the lab and to get them to commercial levels at scale. Uh, Jeff talked about some of the processes that have made it, uh, but there's many technologies that are low carbon out there that really need to be pushed. And so a, a larger uh, initiative and partnership is, is really needed. And some folks have talked about an industry institute, uh, and that's also something that's been, to, been discussed and uh, something we've tried to push. Thank you. Uh, kind of a related question comes from Kenneth Malloy. Uh, so what are the key barriers to implementation of uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage? 
Um, I'll, I'll start with that, and then uh, Peter, maybe uh, you can come and uh, back, back me up there. Uh, some of the challenges is that CCUS has been around for decades, and it's principally been pushed uh, for uh, utilities, power plants at this point, relative to demonstrations. Uh, there haven't been very many demonstrations at scale uh, within industry, and I think that needs to change. So that's, that's one of the opportunity spaces. Uh, second is economics. The current uh, penalty for CCUS is somewhere to 30 to 50 percent of the energy spend for uh, production facilities. That's huge. And we already looked at the energy burden and the associated CO2 penalty. So if the, the ride of CCUS is 30 to 50 percent, uh, that really has got to be uh, reduced. Third, I'll note integration. So uh, particularly for the industrial sector where CCUS has not been deployed at scale, uh, the integration with uh, facilities upstream and downstream uh, is a challenge. There's opportunities in that space though, because process heat uh, where it's available can be used to help reactivate the amines after they have captured the CO2. So there's some options in that space, but certainly a number of, of challenges as well. Peter, anything to add? I think you've given a, a very comprehensive uh, answer there, um, Ed. I mean, the, yeah, the four areas I would highlight from the challenges that, yeah, are indeed innovation, cost, infrastructure, and the regulatory and permitting environment. So I think um, Ed has touched on all of those. I think that I would definitely emphasize the point that CSUS is really a, a family of, of technologies with very, you know, on, especially on the capture side, um, we see very different levels of uh, technology readiness level. Um, as a kind of metric for um, measuring the, the kind of uh, the current status of these technologies today across the different applications um, for carbon capture um, direct air capture and uh, ca capture of uh, cement process emissions, um, capture of uh, emissions from power plants. These are all different uh, capture applications and, and different technologies, even if the transport and storage uh, infrastructure could be, um, it could be the same. So I think that, um, yeah, those are the, the four main dimensions I'd highlight. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll note as well that the capture efficiency for CCUS uh, is somewhere around 80 to 90 percent. Uh, if you try to go much further than that, the costs go up exponentially. So I think the one of the challenges in the space is to try to figure out what to do with the other 10 to 20 percent uh, as well. Um, there are advances in uh, membranes, ionic uh, liquids. Uh, MOFs, uh, metal oxygen frameworks have been used and a number of different uh, avenues are being uh, pursued at this point. Lots of opportunities still for innovation and science. Uh, the Carbon Capture Institute has got some really good uh, reports on uh, CCUS. I'll steer you to as well. Great, thank you. Um, kind of moving back into the back towards the research and innovation space. Um, are there things that, uh, that you're seeing in your three areas that, um, that's coming down, coming down the pike that you think are exciting and potentially, I don't know, disruptive for lack of a better word? That's a good one to Je for Jeff to start on. Yeah. Um, yeah, where to start? Um, you know, it, it, I think the, the you know the area I'm most excited about is um, it, you know the the ocean plastic issue and I you know I, I went with my family to a, um, a a beach summer where you know there should have been no garbage it's in the middle of nowhere and um, I went out one morning and and you know just thought I would pick up any little piece of plastic I found and five minutes later I didn't have a bag with me I, I couldn't carry all the little bits of bottle caps and 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 materials and. You know, the bottom line is there, there, there are so many applications where um, a lot of the plastics that are used in certain applications end up in the environment that, you know, we, we have to get materials that are, that are degradable. Um, I'm particularly excited about the polyhydroxyalkanoates as a class. Um, you know, granted, I, you know, I work in that area. Um, we, we have a chemical route. Um, the, I would say the bigger, more promising route for um, a lot of large scale is by fermentation. Um, there are companies like Mango Materials that are using, um, you know, methane to make these. 
obviously Danimer, um, a company that, that we're starting to work with, makes it from uh, oil, oil and other, um, you know, make it from sugar and other things like that. So um, that's, um, you know, in terms of polymer sustainability, that's that's one of the areas that I'm super excited about. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll chime in uh, next and say, I, I think one of the areas that's particularly interesting is companies picking up tools that are already available to reduce their energy and greenhouse gases. Companies are setting science-based targets uh, that are aggressive, uh, and that's good. Uh, but the, the challenge is how are they going to meet some of those targets? Uh, some companies have been uh, snapping up uh, power purchase agreements like they're candy. Uh, and that's good. It certainly helps with the renewable energy uh, generation. But there's only so much you can do in that space. So adoption of current electric technologies, that, for example, is important. Uh, folks have been looking at hydrogen, and I think that's good uh, as well. Uh, one of the challenges we've seen with hydrogen as far as its use as a chemical feedstock is if the hydrogen comes from the grid and the grid is not yet fully uh, decarbonized, emissions can actually go up. So it, it's important in that case that um, direct use of uh, wind and solar come along. And I think uh, one of the exciting areas there is the use of storage to mitigate the intermittency of wind and solar. Peter, any comments? Yeah, thanks, Ed and Jeff. I, I think the, I guess one, we're not so much in the business of, you know, picking our, our favorite technologies or the picking winners um, here at the IA. But I mean, one area that I think is, um, where we see technologies that are at comparatively lower uh, technology readiness levels generally uh, for heavy industry emissions reductions are those that enable direct electrification of um, processes where either feedstocks or uh, high temperature heat is required. And um, so, Jeff, uh, sorry, Ed already mentioned the uh, consortium around uh, the electrified steam cracker, so providing the process heat to the to the steam cracker um, directly via electricity. Um, uh, iron ore electrolysis in the steel sector, so avoid, avoiding even the need for the use of hydrogen in the reduction of, of iron ore um, and the di direct electrification of various large volume uh, high temperature heating applications such as cement kilns. These are the areas that I personally would be, um, you know, uh, following and uh, excited about because the, the, the challenges or a lot of the kind of hard to abate um, uh, characteristics of these sectors are precisely related to the fact that these um, hydrogen and CCUS technologies have various uh, challenges associated with them, whether they are the uh, challenges that were mentioned for carbon capture earlier on, or some of the um, challenges on the electricity side and the infrastructure side that Ed has alluded to there with respect to hydrogen. So where, where we have avenues to use electric, electricity directly in the areas that it's currently challenging to do so, um, some of these uh, you know, barriers and challenges can be alleviated. Um, but that notwithstanding, hydrogen and CCUS is going to be required. They're both technology families that are going to be required at gigantic scale in the context of a net zero uh, emissions uh, trajectory. So it's, it's about alleviating rather than fully substituting, in, in my view. Um, but that's, uh, that would be a reason why I would be uh, interested in following those developments in those areas. Great. Uh, so we have a question from Atashi Bell. Uh, can someone elaborate on the Buy Clean initiative? How is this different from current USDA Bio Preferred program or the EPA's environmental preferential purchasing? Um, I'll take a take a start on that. Um, I would say scale uh, is the big issue and scope. So the EPA programs and the USDA programs. Um, look at a particular range of products. The buy clean uh, process suggests looking across an entire um, application or sector of materials. So they're looking at uh, building uh, materials and everything that goes into buildings, starting uh, with uh, cement and steel and a few other areas. But second, I'll say that um, it, it's also at an early stage uh, at this point, California has approved it. They're trying to still iron out some of the application, sorry, some of the implementation aspects of that. 
uh, but this is also a national program. Uh, it could, after construction materials, uh, move to, to other materials uh, as well. So I think the other part of it is its reliance on EPDs, environmental product declarations, where they look at the life cycle impact, impacts across several different categories. So carbon is, of course, where they're starting, but folks are also talking about water, uh, land, uh, and other impacts. So I think in addition to scale, I think the scope is the other uh, big differentiator. I mean, I could come in on that question briefly. I think this is an example. I'm afraid I'm not uh, familiar with the exact details of this specific policy, but I, th I think this is an example of the um, family of policies that I mentioned um, in answer to the first question where, you know, the, the power of uh, um, government procurement is, is used to drive a kind of differentiated market for a, a set of products that are produced um, in a, in a uh, you know, more environmentally friendly way. And I, I absolutely agree with Ed's remarks there that, you know, definitions and uh, the scoping around the kind of boundaries of environmental impact of these products needs to be kind of manageable in the sense that it can't be in a kind of endlessly expanding and changing set of criteria, because otherwise that makes the procurement uh, process too uh, complicated. But on the other hand, it uh, needs to be comprehensive enough so that it um, captures the, uh, well, includes the uh, products that are um, being developed uh, that are actually substantially reducing emissions and drives the kind of extra premium that can be paid for those materials um, to those uh, to the right areas. I think in, in the three sectors that I was talking about, in, in chemicals and steel and cement, I think the challenges are, are quite different between those, between those three. When you've got a, a chemical industry that's producing literally hundreds of thousands of, of products at, uh, at very, um, you know, at industrial scale, that is a completely different order of magnitude of challenge in terms of tracking all of the environmental impacts of those, um, of those products compared to, say, uh, the cement industry, where you have not a not a totally undifferentiated product. There are lots of obviously grades of cement, um, but you uh, you can you can I think more straightforwardly kind of assess the manner in which that cement was produced and what its direct emissions footprint was, and, and so on. So I think there there are different challenges for different materials, um, even within these relatively narrow kind of heavy industry boundaries that I've been talking about. Hey, uh, next question. I think I might might direct this to Jeff. Uh, it's from Bala Subramanian. In catalytic upcycling of plastics, has a sustainability assessment been made with regard to the catalysts themselves, especially where noble metal catalysts are being proposed? Yeah, uh, Bala, maybe you can follow up. I, I assume you mean like for existing plastics, like you know, like polyolefins, and um, you know. I, I think definitely noble metal catalyst is going to be a, you know, that's going to be one of the big sticking points. I'm, I'm part of a DOE funded EFRC um, called ICU, um based at Ames National Laboratory. Um, Aaron Sadow is the PI. And, um, and we're working on this directly. And it is a really hard problem. Um, you know, I, I think not only the noble metals, um, you know, if, if you, you know, we're not going to be taking pristine polyethylene and cracking it and making ethylene again, right? There's going to be polyethylene that might have a little bit of PVC. You're going to heat it up. It's going to make HCL and, right, uh, you know, could be trace amounts of materials that are in our plastics, totally destroy the catalyst that we're trying to um, to use to break it down. Um, I think that probably, the, well, I guess what I'm more worried about is, um, you know, I'm here in a hotel room. I got my plastic spoon I have my breakfast with, right? This is a solid. If, if I've got a catalyst and I you know, nothing happens until I melt this thing down and get this to a liquid state that can interact with, you know, a homogeneous or more likely a heterogeneous catalyst that takes heat, right. And it's going to take, um, not just heat to melt, but heat to, you know, get these reactions to occur at the temperatures they need to, to proceed. So, um, we've got, a, a an awful lot of basic science to do, to try to figure out, you know, how can we, um, you know, take these materials you make polyethylene, it's an incredibly downhill, you know, exothermic process. Going back to ethylene is not going to be, you know, you can't defy the laws of thermodynamics. So, um, you know, obviously we can try to do things with catalysts and we don't have the catalysts right now that um, allow you to do it. So 
it does sound very pessimistic, but, um, you know, I say it's a great opportunity for people that want to, you know, do science to try to figure out better ways to break it down. I guess I'm more bullish. I, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb here. You guys are recording this. Um, you can play it back to me in, in 30 years. You know, I'd, I'd like to think in 30, 40 years, you know, we still make polyethylene, but it's not the number one polymer. Um, we're going to have to have polymers that are much more low energy, um, come from re renewables that can, you know, be more readily recycled, um, in a, in a chemically, you know, efficient fashion. And, you know, the problem is polyethylene is a great polymer, right? It, it's really, it's really hard to, um, take things that are thermodynamically downhill and make them go uphill. So, um, so that's my, um, that's my view of the future. Great. Peter, Ed, anything you want to add in? Nope. Yeah, I think uh, Jeff covered that really well. Excellent. Uh, another question from Atashi Bell, and it's about what is the role of synthetic biology in decarbonizing the economy? Right? Because there was a mention in, in Jeff's seminar about fermentation-based companies to make monomers and things like that. Well, let me take that, but I'm going to start by saying I'm in no, no way a, 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 even a um, remote expert in this area, but I will say, you know, I do know a lot about the polyhydroxyalkanoates and, um, you know, if you use um, certain feedstocks like, you know, fatty acids to, to, to ferment, to make PHAs, they get really hot. It's a, you know, you have a massive heat transfer issue and a cooling issue. Um, you know, I would think PHAs that, you know, come from, um, you know, from, from biological processes that can take the heat would immediately um, be a huge advance. Uh, just a couple of things I'll mention is that uh, you've seen synthetic biology being used by companies like Lonzatech to uh, take waste gases and to convert that into, into eth ethanol. Uh, there has been literature for years on using microbes to digest plastic um, I think, you know, one of the challenges there is probably the structure property relationships of what you get out the, at the end. Uh, but I think there are opportunities in that space, perhaps to determine how to most effectively uh, prepare the polymers for, for recycling. Uh, there's some opportunities in that space, I think, as well. Okay. Uh, Peter, any comments? Uh, no, I'm not on that one. I think uh, I think we're well covered there. Okay. Um, don't see any further questions in the Q and A. Um, maybe wait a couple of seconds to see if one pops up. Um, if not, we're we're just about at twelve thirty. So uh, I think perhaps we could start wrapping up this uh, webinar. So first off, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ryder, Dr. Coates, and Dr. Levi for taking time out to uh, give presentations and for this wonderful discussion. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that the three pre presentations that you saw and the recording of this webinar will be posted on to the CSR website next week. and. Um, says here that the URL will be on the screen. So uh, not sure if that's posted or not, but I'm sure it would be on the NASCA CSR website. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, comments, or concerns, please email csr at nas.edu. Uh, the CSR's next event will be a day and a half workshop on laboratory automation excuse me, let me say that again, laboratory automation and accelerated synthesis. And the date of this uh, workshop will be November 16th and 17th. Uh, so for more information about this event and more information in general, you can subscribe for updates, which can be done on the CSR website. So once again, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and the speakers, and I hope you have a great day. And this concludes today's webinar.